What's up, my wrinkle brains? It's Dev from SBMTG, a.k.a. the Pulled Pork Princess, a.k.a. the Troll Model. And today, I finally get to show off a deck that's been on the Patreon polls for like it's two weeks, three weeks now, maybe something like that. It hasn't been voted through yet, but it does have a small yet vocal group of supporters. So I figured I'd finally do it for them and me, if nobody else. <laughs> hey, we're going to look at Four Color Troll. Yo, I'm sorting through some heinous haters like a poopa scooper. I'm dead is trying to take my life like a Koopa Troopa. I'm double Mario. That mean I'm super super. And I'm freaking dangerous like a Troopa Troopa Cabre. Got them all day like a Kanye, but I'm way better. Getting cheddar in Monterey. But Jack, you don't know, man. You got the show, man. You want roast beef? Well, I'm Arby's. And we're back. Now, some of you might remember this combo from the beginning of the season because I'm far from the first person to try this deck out. It was a bit of a meme when Throne of Eldraine first came out. And a couple of different YouTubers have tried this deck here and there. But I haven't seen anybody try it since the Oko Band. Fresh new standard. Let's see if this deck finally has the legs to do things. But first, just in case you haven't seen this combo, I might as well go ahead and show it to you. We're playing Hushbringer along with Clackbridge Troll. But if you still need it spelled out for you, or you're listening rather than watching, turns out a lot of people do that, then the basic interaction here is that as long as we have a little hush puppy out when we play a Clackbridge Troll, then our opponent don't get no goats. Terrible situation for them. Clackbridge Troll never generates the goats because of Hushbringers. So we just have an 8-8 Trample Haste. That seems pretty good. Now our opponent can still sacrifice stuff to tap the troll, but it's going to have to be actual creatures and not just useless goats that we've generated for them for that purpose. So they have to actually get rid of real stuff and we draw a card and we gain three life. A lot of times you'll get more value out of your opponent tapping Clackbridge Troll than you would if you'd have actually attacked with it. But we're not just here for a troll party. It turns out Hushbringer provides a lot of ancillary value in this package, too. This just shuts down so many random things in Standard right now. A bunch of stuff in the mono black deck, for instance, like Cauldron Familiar, which is pretty freaking important. It can still block your guys. They sacrifice it to Witch's Oven. It's annoying, but they're not going to slowly drain you out so long as you have a Hushbringer. And that's important in and of itself. But it also shuts down Ayara from procking, shuts down Midnight Reaper from triggering, Cruel Celebrant, Corpse Knight, a bunch of stuff like that, and all kinds of creatures in this format from Gilded Goose to Wicked Wolf and on. Actually, one more thing before I move on from the combo, because I just want to kind of brag on Hushbringer for a second here. Yeah, this can get taken down by a bunch of small ball removal in the format like Shock and Disfigure, and that kind of sucks, but before it does get hit by those spells, it can actually do a fair amount of good blocking for you. You know, it's a two toughness lifelinker, so it'll block things like Knight of the Ebon Legion before Knight can pump. That can be important some of the time, but more importantly than that, it's really good in the mono red matchup where it blocks things like Scorch Spitter and Fervent Champion and gains you a little bit of life back while also killing the creature swinging into you so this can actually be really sweet in the early game and it forces your opponent to remove it and sometimes your opponent won't realize that they're kind of forced to remove this or they can't play magic until it's a little bit too late but of course you're not always going to have a hushbringer down when you play a clackbridge troll it's not a perfect world your hushbringer will die to removal some of the time and all that so the other best thing that you can do once you do get a troll down is to just play some kind of sweeper that kills all of your opponents goats and hopefully their other creatures too but doesn't actually kill your Clackbridge Troll. So we've got a number of cards in the deck that can do exactly that. In fact, it's the whole reason that Red's in the deck in the first place. I'm playing two copies of Flame Sweep in the main, but I'm also playing two Legions in and two Ethereal Absolution, which I'll put in the Sweepers category here, because not only is this going to kill all of your opponent's goats that you've generated with Clackbridge Troll, but it's also going to kill Edgewall Innkeepers, Foulmire Knights, Beloved Princesses, I guess we'll call them that, whatever the token's called that uh, Love Struck Beast produces, and a bunch of creatures in mono red and stuff. Like Ethereal Absolution just outright kills a bunch of creatures and prevents those same creatures from being played again later on in the game. So it's just crazy for that, but it also just makes sure that your your troll can swing for nine on an ungoated board. So <laughs> that's pretty sweet right there. And it also makes creatures for you. This can be a win condition in and of itself. I just cannot tell you enough how good Ethereal Absolution is in this deck. And it's a pretty good combo in and of itself with Clackbridge Troll, but apart from just comboing with Troll, this is a really sick card to actually resolve in this format right now, so at least two copies of that, but Legion's in, obviously, you can just target the GOAT token and takes them all out, so there's that really cheap, a cost-effective way of doing that, but this will also take out all kinds of stuff in the early game, things like Cauldron Familiar, if they don't have a Witch's Oven down yet, keep that in mind, but this will also take out all kinds of other small creatures in 
and stuff. Just Legion's End is a sweet card, and even if you're not targeting goats with it, there's all kinds of other stuff you could be targeting with it. So at least a couple copies of that. I put in Flame Sweep because not only does this kill all the opponent's goats and stuff, but it's one of those rare sweepers that we could play that doesn't kill Hushbringers and whatnot. You know, creatures that you control with flying are more or less completely safe from a Flame Sweep, so leaving all of our Hushbringers intact is actually a really important part of Flame Sweep. Now another sweet thing about Flame Sweep is that it doesn't kill the Gilded Geese that we're playing. All four copies of these, along with four copies of Leaf Kin Druid, and yes, astute commenter who has already paused the video and began writing this out, I am well aware that if you have a Hushbringer out, you play a Gilded Goose, you don't get a food, everybody has a terrible time. But this really hasn't been much of a problem. Usually you're going to be wanting to play Gilded Goose on turn one, which if you're doing your math correctly, is well before you're ever even able to play a Hushbringer. So you're still going to get the ramp off of it in that situation. And even if you do drop a Gilded Goose on turn four or five when you have a Hushbringer in play, you might not get the food right then, but Goose can still carry you into the late game by making food for you starting on the next turn. So again, I've played a bunch of games with this, trying to get it through the Patreon poll for the last like three weeks. I know this deck very well, and it just really hasn't presented too much of an issue that Hushbringer and Goose are in the same deck. You see, we're playing the whole deck here based around a five drop creature. And it is my belief that if you're trying to play a five drop as the centerpiece of your deck in standard, you either need to be playing a control deck or ramping into your five drops, or you probably just shouldn't be playing five drops in the first place, an aggro deck, for instance. So in other words, I think that we have to be able to ramp into the Clackbridge Troll and these other big money cards, these expensive cards that we're playing. Now, Leafkin Druid is not ideal, obviously not the optimal drop for the deck. You may be thinking P. Diddy should be in this slot, and I would tend to agree with you, but since we're playing Flame Sweep in the deck, I decided to throw a three toughness creature in this slot that can nonetheless ramp really, really well, even if it doesn't fix our mana the way we want it to. You could go Paradise Druid, take out the Flame Sweeps, and just make this an Abzan deck if you wanted to do that, and yeah, it might run a little bit smoother, but you wouldn't have Flame Sweep, and that would suck. So, even though Paradise Druid is a very, very sweet card, I felt like Leafkin was the better choice here because I really don't want to lose a P. Diddy to a Flame Sweep. Now a lot of the rest of this deck is other pieces of removal. We're playing two copies of Assassin's Trophy, three copies of Prison Realm, and two copies of Mortify. Mortify is a really important card right now because Fires might be the best deck in the format right now. It's, it's either probably Fires or the Jun Sacrifice deck. I'm not quite sure, but that's for another video. In fact, a video in the very, very near future. But in any case, I think that Fires is a really important deck, and it's nice to have a main deck thing that kills enchantments. So I think Mortify is the right call here. Plus, it can just kill creatures and stuff. That's important. But <laughs> Prison Realm takes out Planeswalkers, and again, big ticket creatures and such we need to get rid of, so that's important. But Assassin's Trophy just takes out anything. So <laughs> between these three cards and some of the sweepers and such that we're playing, we actually cover the field really really well and we have a relatively high defensive stat but we're not quite done with the deck yet i'm playing one copy of find finality and even though there's only one in the deck it's still a really important card every both halves of it service us greatly you know the first half can find not only a clackbridge troll or a hushbringer but both of them at the same time in the late game from your graveyard and that can be sweet because there's gonna be a lot of games where you're just gonna play both cards on the same turn to sort of circumvent any removal that your opponent might have, especially if your opponent's tapped out or something. It's often the right play to just play both of the creatures at the same time, as you see in these clips that I'm showing you right now. That is very often the right call. So fine finality can often set that situation up for you really, really easily. But the second half is really sweet too. Not only is this just a sweeper that doesn't kill your Clackbridge troll, but kills Pretty much everything else, for the most part, on both sides of the table. This is mostly meant to kill your opponent's goats, right? If nothing else, this kills your opponent's goats, so you can swing with your Clackbridge Troll. So count another sweeper in the, the sweeper pile for the deck. But there's also the fact that, yeah, this can just kill everything if that's what you want it to do. You know, if you need a little breathing room so you can actually get to plays like Clackbridge Troll and Ethereal Absolution, well, you can just ramp into this, call it a day. Now, I've also got three copies of Questing Beast in this deck, who is technically better than it even usually is, in a way, because this can just swing right through goats that we've made with Clackbridge Troll. Yeah, they might be able to sack goats and tap down Troll, but even if they have untapped goats out, they, they can't do anything about a Questing Beast. So that's, that's really sweet that we just get free swings with this through a field full of goats, but it'll swing past a fair amount of other creatures in the format, take out Planeswalkers and all that. Vigilance plus Death Touch is a really stupid 
combination of abilities. <laughs> it just swings in and then stays up to block whatever it wants to kill the next turn. Like Questing Beast, it's still a dumb creature. We can ramp into it on turn three with either Goose or Leaf Kindred. It's still just so silly. And very often, your opponent will have to waste a removal spell on Questing Beast. That'll clear the way a little bit more for your Clackbridge troll in the next turn. There's just so much that Beast does. But let's finish off this main deck business with one copy of Kinrith, the Return King. You probably don't have to play this card, but I feel like I felt like I had to play this card. <laughs> we needed another big threat in the deck. It can't just all be trolls and questing beasts and that's it because that's really not enough. You know, we, we got to finish games off and Kenrith is a great way of doing that if you can get it to stick to the board. Plus, again, there's fine finality just in case he doesn't stick to the board. You can get him back out of your graveyard and once he's on the table, you can use him to get other stuff out of your graveyard. Clackbridge Troll, Hushbringer or something like that set up a Clackbridge Troll plus Hushbringer thing, you know. That can be really sweet to be able to do, but it also just gains you life, you know. Gives your creatures haste, including itself. It's just, man, Kenrith does it literally all once it's on the table, and we can activate just about any of these abilities except for the draw a card ability, which would be really sweet if we could activate it. But that said, we can also just throw a bunch of counters on stuff. You know, I've done that a few times. You got a life-linking Hushbringer out, and your opponent doesn't have any cards in their hand or any other way to remove Hushbringer or whatever. Well, just throw two or three plus one plus one counters on Hushbringer, fly over for some lifelink damage, and get yourself back in the game. There's a million ways to abuse Kenrith. Plus, he can also just attack in for wins. So, we needed a big threat. Let's. I think this is probably the best one we can play. Now here's your mana base right here. There's 26 lands in this deck despite the ramp. Trust me, you want them. But basically it breaks down to 14 green sources, 10 white sources, 10 black sources, and 6 red sources, which doesn't sound like much for those last three colors. But do remember that you've got Fabled Passage as well as Gilded Goose in the deck, so you're kind of adding 7 to all of those numbers, you know. Rather than 6, we've actually got kind of 13 red sources, which is way more appropriate for casting the one red card in the deck. So do keep that in mind. You know, again, 10 black sources, 10 white sources doesn't sound like much, but with Fabled Passage and Gilded Goose, we're making plenty of all the colors that we need. Now here's our sideboard right here, and there's some pretty cut and dried stuff in here, you know. Obvious sideboard pieces in our color combinations like Devout Decree and Noxious Grasp we absolutely have to play. Throw in another copy of Flame Sweep in there for another sweeper against the aggro decks. Shifting Ceratops against control decks and notably like Simic Flash and stuff like that. This can be really good against, but anything that's trying to crank out Teferi and whatnot... Shifting Ceratops is ridiculous, so play that card. And, again, a good example of a creature that doesn't generate ETB or dies value, yet it's still ridiculous. So, again, good example of that. But there's also an Elder Spell from we need to take out a bunch of Planeswalkers all at one time, which will happen. But there's Sorcerer Spyglass as well. This can just shut down all kinds of Planeswalkers. Plus, it can shut down the Cat Oven deck, which is pretty sweet as well. We need different answers to that, and Sorcerer's Spyglass is pretty sweet at being able to do that, just name Witch's Oven. Devout Decree is sweet at being able to do that if you can actually nail a Cauldron Familiar Bef you know, while their Witch's Oven is tapped or before they have an oven out. Keep that in mind, but Devout Decree gets rid of all kinds of crazy stuff and exiles it forever, but maybe the most important card in this sideboard, in this format right now, is Cinder Vines. This is another reason to play red, and it's actually a huge reason to play red. Not only is Fires of Invention a very important deck, but again, I think maybe the other best deck in the format is very likely some sort of cat food or cat combo. Um, cat Oven <laughs> deck, whatever we're calling it this week, you know, but the Cauldron Familiar Witch's Oven deck is just crazy, whether it's Sultai or Jund or Green Black or whatever. So this can not only take out fires, but it also takes out Witch's Ovens. So I think Cinder Vines is just absolutely insane right now, and it'll also punish control decks and other decks that are very heavy on playing non-creature spells and whatnot. So I just think Cinder Vines is another reason to play red in this deck if you weren't already sold on playing red. Cinder Vines is slyly, subtly, one of the best sideboard cards in the entire format. Now, here are your power rankings right here. Final score, Nintendo 64, and that's a lot of sevens. I mean, seven isn't necessarily mediocre. Seven is definitely still above average, but the deck in many cases doesn't get much more than above average, especially in terms of consistency. You know, for everything to go right, you have to play a Hushbringer. Hushbringer has to stay out. Then you have to play a Clackbridge Troll. And then your opponent has to not kill your Clackbridge Troll. I mean, there's just kind of there's stuff that needs to happen and needs to go right for this deck to win. And up against decks like Fires of Invention, the 
deck is not necessarily at its best, but we do have some pretty decent matchups. As long as Mono Red doesn't go too fast, we can definitely keep up with them and usually rise above them in the later game, you know, especially if they can't let us attack with Clackbridge Troll. They just keep tapping it. You'd be surprised how much life a Clackbridge Troll or two can gain for you over the course of a game. So decks that are just trying to rush you down, if you get the right hand or they don't get the right opening hand, that can be a 50-50 game some of the time. So keep that in mind. But we're also really good in a lot of games against mono black decks or other cat food decks. You know, I've already talked about how good we are post boards against them. But just because Hushbringer exists, we actually do really well well against them like this game right here which I'm gonna show you the entire gameplay of but it's only about a minute and a half let's watch if you would how good Hushbringer is against these decks and how much it shuts down just about everything they're trying to do we get a lot of value off of Hushbringer on the in this game and eventually our opponent is just going to read Hushbringer and decide to shut it down for the day While I'm giving gameplay examples, here's the end of the game I was showing you earlier. We eventually get Ethereal Absolution down, kill half our opponent's board, and they decide they'd rather just go ahead and give the game up than sacrifice their last three creatures and die on the next turn. So there you have it. The deck is fun to play, but it does... It feels like trolling in a way. I'm not sure that anyone's going to bring this deck to Mythic Championship 7, and if they do register the thing, they themselves are probably just trolling as well. So I'm not sure that the deck is the most powerful thing in the format right now, but it is pretty sweet, and you're not going to run the risk anymore, at least, of getting your Hushbringer or your Troll just turned into a 3-3. I mean, <laughs> ever since the Oko ban, five mana creatures that do stuff are actually, like, playable again. So in a way, this deck is way more playable than it was at the beginning of the season. Actually, in a, in a lot of ways. But that said, I will say that even though the deck isn't like incredible or anything, it's probably the best it's ever been right now. So try this thing out. Or you can you know, just build the Abzan version, whatever. There's a million different directions you could take this deck. You know, There's just black-white troll with Legion's End, Ethereal Absolution. You could definitely do whatever you wanted to. But I've built a lot of different troll decks in the month that I've been trying to get people to vote this thing through. And so far, this has been my favorite build. So if you wanted to try it out click the first link in the description go over to Takag playa pick up any pieces that you might need at the lowest prices on the information superhighway you know if, you've, if you're still the kind of person that builds decks in paper a dying breed but <laughs> i know y'all are still out there right you just click the link in the description pick it up at the, at the prices the good the good lolos but anyway do all the other youtube stuff while you're at it you know like the video subscribe if you haven't done that hit the bell we're not really sure what it does but do it because it's supposed to do something. Uh, check out the Patreon if you want to keep the channel afloat because no one knows what's going to happen at the beginning of the year when Kappa goes through. I don't know if y'all have been following that, but literally no one knows if their channel's going to die or not. So if you want to make sure this channel doesn't die, then head on over to the Patreon, throw a dollar in the pot. That'll help you vote on what decks you want to see next. But And you'll get to see more Ziggy, who has been down here. I just need to adjust the camera angle to where it actually... Are you still asleep? Hey, Bubba. Come on. Just need to adjust the camera angle to where it actually picks up on Ziggy because I know that's why half of you come here. <laughs> anyway, I think that I'm actually I might be done for this one. Is that it? Is that it, Ziggy? You think that's all? Pretty sure it is. But anyway, I guess I'll catch you cats later. Do all the 
do all the things. Did I miss anything? Follow me on Twitter at SBMTGDev. I mean, that's about it. But yeah, do the do the stuff. And I'll catch y'all later. I'm Dev from the place. Thanks for watching, my wizards. Spread love and be kind. Y'all already know what time it is. It's the Patreon shout out. It's exactly that time. So I got to talk about Seraph this time around. You have advocated for this deck before a few times. As a matter of fact, the last poll, this deck didn't actually show up, and Seraph was like, Four Color Trolls, do it! So. This one's for you, as well as Andrew Marinkovich. I'd throw you in there, too, because both of y'all uh, were kind of the last straw here for me. You know, I saw that y'all replied about this deck in the last Patreon poll that it wasn't even a part of. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to do this deck. I'm going to do it. <laughs> y'all haven't been the only ones that have been super, like, vocal about wanting to see this deck. But, especially Seraph, I believe you have been the most vocal. So I wanted to do this again for you and me, if nobody else. But, hey... You know, I hope that you enjoyed it, if nothing else, because it's kind of, it's for y'all. And again, me, because I've been really wanting to show off this deck. <laughs> like, by the, t by the time I actually got around to putting it on the Patreon poll, I think that like eight other YouTubers had already done it really early in the season. So I'm sorry it took so long to get to this deck, but I tried. I tried to put it on the Patreon poll. I, I really, I did. But hey, we finally got there together. We made it, Seraph. We, we saw the deck we like. <laughs> 